History has not been kind to horses. Many people talk about the 600,000 people killed in the American Civil War, but some overlook that the horse and mule death toll is over 1 million. In Victorian England, it was not uncommon for trolleys and factories to work horses until they dropped dead, sometimes in the middle of busy streets. Up and into the 20th century, horses brutally stood with us side by side in wartime and in civilian life. And even today, where the average person almost never interacts with horses in their everyday lives, we still see the horse constantly in art and media. For every culture with horses, there's a different meaning applied to them. In ancient Greece, the animal was a sign of aspiration and connection to the gods, which we can see most clearly in Pegasus. The Nordic people believed in horses for day and night, called Hrimfaxi and Skinfaxi, who traversed land and sea and moved with the wind. Gandalf's horse Shadowfax was directly influenced by this Norse mythology. But in this video, I want to talk about a specific horse mythology, the American version, one deeply ingrained in the modern American conscience. American cinema has historically used the horse as a symbol of status, masculinity, and mastery over nature. And to explore this particular meaning of the horse, historians don't have to look at ancient paintings and stories like with older civilizations. We can actually very clearly clearly see the symbolism of horses in the movies and TV of the last 100 years, up and into the current day. So what do I mean by the horse as a symbol of mastery? The horse provides the perfect opportunity to show man's control over nature. For one thing, horses are very wild and unpredictable. They're too large to keep in the home like a dog and strong enough to easily kill a human, so they are a worthy opponent to control. Bronc riding reminds us of their strength because they're genuinely dangerous in certain contexts. Despite these characteristics, we still manage to tame them on a map massive scale. We are able to control them, send them into battle, and use them as tools, more so than any other animal of that size. And unlike cattle or other livestock, they can easily be mounted. There's nothing that shows mastery over nature more than being on top of a large wild beast, directing it where you want it to go, riding at a higher vantage point than pedestrians. To showcase my point, how do the creators of the Planet of the Apes series show that the monkeys are dominating the planet, are no longer simply wild animals, and are taking charge? This simple image tells us everything we need to know about how how much the monkeys are evolving, and that's because of all the meaning associated with riding a horse. In some of the earliest forms of cinema, we can see how the horse-human relationship reinforces horse riding as a symbol of mastery. In 1878, Edward Moybridge rigged 24 cameras on a racetrack with trip wires that went off as a horse galloped by. He wanted to see if all four of the horse's feet come off the ground at once during gallop, something that happens too quickly for the human eye to see on its own. This experiment tries to master the movement of the horse. In a way, Moybridge was taming the wild, unknown aspects of horseback riding and turning them into something controllable by the camera and by humans. The cameraman is a master of the world around him, capturing the horse as he wants to make an unknown part of nature known. This experiment became one of the first primitive forms of a motion picture, and it paved the way for cinema to contain the wild nature of the horse. From then on, the horse in movies reflected a thing to master, a wild beast to represent who could control it and who couldn't. These early ideals of horseback riding found their way into Hollywood, particularly in the Western genre. In these movies, the horse showcases the mastery and control of the typical Western hero. The horse is an extension of these masterful riders who could effortlessly handle their horses in dangerous situations. A classic example of control through horseback riding comes from John Wayne in Stagecoach. Throughout the movie, the people riding the stagecoach are being controlled by others. They either change plans to avoid an Apache attack or because the military made them do so. Symbolically, it makes sense that these two outside forces would control the fate of the stagecoach. Both the Apache and the military are the men actually riding on horseback, unlike the stagecoach, where the horses are in front pulling the people behind them. John Wayne famously abandons the stagecoach to ride one of the horses himself, giving the visual cue that he is now taking control by becoming a man on a horse. In this final battle scene, the military and stagecoach members shoot the Apache off of their horses, indicating that now the Apache are no longer in control. There's actually a running gag in American westerns where men are dragged by horses. Here we see a complete reversal of the traditional roles because the horse is in control instead of the man. This trope is always reserved for the characters not in control, the ones without the suave and mastery of the traditional American hero. Either they can't control their horse or they ride the horse in a bastardized way. Maybe they're too short to ride the horse themselves or they have to fake riding altogether. You'll never see John Wayne riding a horse in any way other than one that shows cool manly control. Which brings up another key aspect of horseback riding in American cinema. In the real world, horseback riding is one of the most gender neutral competitions to exist today. In the Olympics, equestrian events are some of the few where men and women compete against each other. But in American cinema, that is not the case. With some notable exceptions, women on 
on horses are few and far between, especially at the peak of the Western genre. This phenomenon is historically accurate since the men had the agency, money, and land to own their own horses. We can still feel this masculine perception of horseback riding in modern media. It explains why this joke works. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. The ideal man is one that rides a horse. Any movie that puts women on a horse usually challenges this norm of men on horseback. In Brokeback Mountain, Lorraine first sees Jack while she's riding a horse and he's on foot, already establishing a reversal of gender roles. On the horse, she physically towers over him. This role reversal continues when she approaches him at the bar to hit on him, an act traditionally done by the man. Throughout the movie, their positions in the marriage get challenged. She's the one operating the company with the traditional office desk, while he fights for control in the home. The initial power dynamic dynamic of her on horseback establishes masculinity in the movie. She rides the show horse, showing her power, wealth, and control, while Jack is thrown off a bull, showing his lack of control and a hint at his non-traditional male role. Westworld shows just how much the hosts are breaking the rules by having Dolores, a docile female character, become a horse-riding gunslinger. With horses so closely associated with masculinity, control, and power, it's no surprise that characters will also kill other people's horses to assert dominance. This power grab gets done most famously in The Godfather and The Public Enemy. If a horse shows control, killing the horse removes the control. There are also racial undertones to horseback riding. It was illegal for black people to buy a horse in many parts of the antebellum South. Such a law seems unnecessary because black people did not have the money or agency to own a horse in the first place. This redundancy implies that the law existed as a symbolic gesture, a reminder by white Southerners that black people should not have the status and power associated with riding a horse. Django Unchained touches on the racial issues of horseback riding. The simple act of being black and on a horse challenges traditional portrayals of men on horseback. It's such a great movie because it lets minority characters have the same cool mastery and control that was originally reserved for white men. The movie perfectly showcases horseback riding as a power dynamic. Right in the first scene, there's a power reversal where a horse immobilizes a man the opposite of a man controlling the horse. Many times in the movie, weaker characters are either thrown off their horse or shot off their horse, but never Django. When we watch the movie, we never consciously observe who is riding the horse well or not, but these images play into subconscious American ideas of mastery through mastery of the horse. We can feel how much more control Django has compared to the other white characters, apart from Dr. King Schultz, who can command his horses at will. And Fritz. <laughs> We can feel how much more control Django has compared to the other white characters. The KKK members can't see for themselves, so they let the horse take control. I can't see, you can't see. So what? All that matters is can the fucking horse see? This KKK charge feels like a comedic revision of a similar scene in The Birth of a Nation. Filmed in 1915, D.W. Griffith portrays these KKK members much differently than the easy-to-trick idiots in Django. Klansmen charge into town on horseback to rescue Elsie from the hands of black men. On screen, the epic and skillful riding on a horse transforms these Klansmen from an unruly mob into heroes saving the day. This movie uses horses to show the KKK members as heroic and in control, and they disturbingly use their mastery to attack and suppress black people in the movie. The cruelest irony in both The Birth of a Nation and Django Unchained is that horses themselves are slaves. They were tamed and forced to work, historically for white men. In the cinematic sphere, controlling the horse shows if their handler is a good master. With Django as a former slave, his role as a horseback rider and master is confusing, since it's a slave controlling a slave. This unnatural relationship confuses characters throughout the movie. Django repeatedly does things a master would do, like whipping people and manipulating people. Do I sound like a fucking slave? The horse symbolizes his new role as a master of his domain. But I wanna go further. I want to suggest that in some cases, this symbolism of horse riding exists past just the movies. It bleeds into real life. You know that it is special election day, and we do expect to see uh, Senate candidate Roy Moore arriving by horseback uh, to the polls. Is it a coincidence that Roy Moore, a conservative Republican, rode a horse to the polls during his campaign in Alabama? I don't think so. He rode that horse when he didn't have to. It was a symbolic gesture. He was trying to evoke American perceptions of the West, ones of mastery and control. Now, I'm not saying that riding a horse to the polls is necessarily a bad thing. But I will say that men on horseback, particularly when embodying old ideas of the American cowboy, evoke concepts of domination and masculinity that are inherently problematic in certain contexts. A state of emergency has been declared in the U.S. state of Virginia. It's Jefferson. They were protesting the planned removal of a Confederate monument from a city park. Confederate statues were taken down in New Orleans after two years of court battles and a heated public debate. Protests and now violence. It's extremely painful. I was in tears yesterday to see that. How would that hurt? 
It hurts. I want America. It hurts. America has debated the removal of Confederate monuments around the country for the last several years. Opponents of the statues claim that these statues were not built as memorials, but rather to intimidate black people and to reaffirm white supremacy. One aspect of these statues rarely mentioned is the fact that these men are very commonly on horseback. It's one thing to have these people standing, but the fact that they are on horseback gives them a certain mythological authority. Like a John Wayne Western hero, a man on horseback symbolizes a man in control, a master of his domain, a person of wealth and status physically above the pedestrians around him. But the mythologizing of these men disguises a sinister history. Though some Americans may look to these statues and be reminded of admirable Western heroes, other Americans may look at them and see a reminder of the men on horses who fought to keep their ancestors in chains. After all, the horse is itself a slave, taken from the wild and tamed to work as a tool, and the rider is his master. Whether you feel it consciously or not, a Confederate white man riding a horse on a monument evokes slavery imagery, and a historical look at riding in American cinema shows how the design of these statues makes them aggressive tools for intimidation. So what should we do about them? Polls show America is torn on whether to take them down, but there's more to consider than simply whether they should stay the same or whether they should go away. So there's a third option. The third option is we engage our contemporary artists of this time. We have them make sculptures that exist in the communities that they live in. We present those sculptures in the same community squares where these Robert E. Lee sculptures exist. We pull those Robert E. Lee sculptures down from the pedestal, bring them at the same level as these new contemporary works, and we force these works to engage one another. Richmond, Virginia has five Confederate leaders on Monument Avenue, including Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. But one other monument commonly falls under the radar when talking about these iconic centerpieces. Tennis legend Arthur Ashe also has his own statue on Monument Avenue. Despite a much more modest design than his Confederate counterparts, the proposal of his statue sparked a racial debate at the time of its erection in the 1990s. This statue is a step in the right direction, challenging Monument Avenue as a place reserved for white Confederate leaders. Even so, I think Richmond has an opportunity in the current political climate to add other more challenging monuments. Monument Avenue follows the tradition of white men in art. Aristocrats in the 18th century commonly commissioned portraits of themselves on horseback to signify their importance, wealth, and power. It's designed for domination. It's a, it's a language designed to make the sitter feel as though he could ride this steed and control it with a pinky, control it with the sheer will of his mind. It's a propaganda act. In response to these traditional portraits, artist Kahinda Wiley has a piece titled Napoleon Leading the Army Over the Alps. Wiley's piece recontextualizes the famous Napoleon painting by replacing him with a black man in contemporary clothing, critiquing the historical tradition of ignoring the black cultural experience. It crystallized something that I'd been thinking about for a very long time, which is that black men have been giving very little in this world, and that I as an artist have the power and the potential and the will to do something about it. Because it's not just that these Confederate heroes invoke slavery imagery. There's another opportunity with the debate over these statues, the opportunity to make heroes out of people that have historically been put to the side. And we go into the front entrance of the museum and there's that amazing sculpture of Teddy Roosevelt out there. You guys know which one I'm talking about. Teddy Roosevelt is sitting there with one hand on the horse, bold, strong, sleeves rolled up. I don't know if he's bare chested, but it kind of feels like it. <laughs> And on the left-hand side of him is a Native American walking. And on the right-hand side of him is an African American walking. And as we're moving up the stairs, getting closer to the sculpture, my oldest son, who's nine, says, Dad, how come he gets to ride and they have to walk? I think an artist like Kahinda Wiley or Titus Kafar could create a great addition to Monument Avenue with a statue that rethinks who gets to ride on horseback. So I'm not saying you should feel bad for liking classic cowboy movies. Some of those movies are amongst the greats, but I am saying that the horse rider relationship deserves a closer look because it reveals subtleties in our media and how we can make more powerful and challenging art. Okay, I'm done preaching this stuff. I'll get off my high horse. But there is one thing I won't get off my high horse about. As some of you might know, I'm actually a software developer. When I'm not making videos, I'm writing code and logging in and out of tons of applications and websites. I keep all my passwords secure and out of mind using Dashlane. Dashlane 
is a secure and easy to use password protection service with over 10 million users. In the current tech landscape, it is definitely the best way to manage the dozens of passwords you use on a regular basis. When you need to log into a site, Dashlane automatically adds your secure password, and it works on all phones and computers from iPhones to Windows computers. You can get these features for free, or Dashlane Premium gives you unlimited password storage plus a VPN for every device you use, and dark web monitoring to make sure your data is not being bought and sold on the dark web. Click the link in the description or go to dashlane.com slash now you see it to download it for free. And if you want all those features, you can use the coupon code now you see it. Thanks for watching.